Okay, it's good to see everyone. Um, just thinking about uh, our schedule coming up next Wednesday, uh, era of Thanksgiving. I think uh, we can still meet at 11 o'clock and uh, we'll be on, yeah, as, as far as I know, we'll be on for the next few Wednesdays. So um, I appreciate uh, the good wishes for my parents moving down and I appreciate your understanding for uh, the, the, the need that I had to do to cancel class in order to take care of them. So, um, uh, so uh, this week's portion is Vayishlach and uh, the blessing for Torah study, Baruch HaTad Anai, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Shekit Shana B'mitzvot Tavit Sivanu, La'asok B'divrei Torah. So the, um, the first four uh, portion of the first, first four sections of Vayishlach uh, discuss the uh, impending and then the actual reunion of Jacob and, and Esau. <clears throat> they left on terrible terms, actually not in person with each other. Jacob just ran away from Esau's anger after Jacob got the blessing that supposedly Esau was supposed to get. And that now it's 20, 21 years later, Jacob's unsure if Esau is still mad at him, but he knows he's going, he has no choice but to um, meet up with him because he's returning home. And Esau, as far as he knows, is still there in the land of Israel. So, um, so I don't want to focus on any of those first four sections of Ayishlach. I'd rather um, choose this um, uh, difficult section, uh, which is the fifth aliyah, which is chapter 34 of, uh, of Genesis. So in Eitz Chaim, that would be page 206. Uh, whatever edition of Chumash you have, look for the fifth aliyah or look for chapter 34 uh, in Genesis. So um, we'll see uh, right away why this is a difficult section. And um, let's see uh, how interactive this can be in terms of understand making sense of this. So, and we'll see how far we can get uh, in about 45, 50 minutes. Okay. Vatetse dina bat lea asher yalda liaakov lirot bivnot haaretz. So I'm going to I'm going to translate literally, and you'll see the English translation. See what the translation does. Dina went out, no, Dina, the daughter of Leah. And th so there, there's parenthetical notes here. So I'm, I'm saving the verb for after the parenthetical notes. Dina, the daughter of Leah, parentheses, who was born to Jacob, end parentheses, went out to see among the daughters of the land. Okay, so that's the literal translation. You see how challenging it is. What does that mean? So what does it mean to see among the daughters of the land? So the English translation, the Eitz Chaims has, went out to visit the daughters of the land. Went out to visit. I'm not, I'm not so sure. So, so she, she went out to see among the daughters of the land. From a straightforward reading of the verse, I think that means she wanted to hang out with other girls. I have, we have no idea how old Dina is at this point in the story. We're not, we're, we're told who she is. She's the daughter of Leah, whom Jacob fathered. Okay, we were told of her birth in last week's portion when Leah and Rachel and their maidservants, Bilhah and Zilpah, 
all were impregnated by Jacob. So we, we know the birth order and we do know that Leah, uh, that Dina was born. So this is the ne next th that we're hearing about her is here. Okay, so she went out to see, she went out or she left you know, it's interesting if we, uh, so, so it's translated here as went out. Vatetse is went out. Last week's portion is Vayetse, which is the same word. Uh, Vayetse for a man, Vatetse for a woman. So it's the exact same word. Uh, there on 166 at the beginning of the portion, Vayetse, it's translated left. Here it's translated went out. It's the same word. Okay. So it depends on context, what you want, how we understand the leaving or the going out. When we say a blessing over bread, we say hamotzi. It's the same root, yud, sadi, aleph. And just a hamotzi is the one who brings out. By Vatetse is the, the person, him or herself, going out. Okay, so Hamotzi is an action being done to the object. In this form, the object is doing the action. Okay, there's a technical term for that in grammar, and I don't know what the technical term is. <laughs> so, uh, but it's the same root. Okay, so to to go out to see among the daughters of the land. Hi, Rita. We're on 206 in the Eitz Chaim. We're looking at the fifth aliyah of Vayishlach. So I just translated the first verse to see how difficult it is to translate it. So um, <clears throat> now uh, the um, uh, we want to look at the second verse before we start looking at the commentary. So she went out, Dina went out to see among the daughters of the land. Verse two, Vayar ota Shechem ben Chamor hachivi, nesi haaretz, vayikach ota, vayishkav ota, vayeaneha. So Shechem, Shechem, the son of Chamor the Chivite, parentheses, the chief of the land, or the president of the land. So it's probably probably should not be translated president. That is how the ancient biblical word is used in modern Hebrew. So there was no concept of president back in the time of the Bible. But the same word is used for president. In the book of Numbers, we're told about the Nisi'im, each, each Nasi of each tribe. So it's the chief of the tribe. Uh, Rabbi Judah, who entered, who uh, edited the Mishnah, is known as Yehuda HaNasi. He's the head of the Sanhedrin. So the Nasi is the person in charge of the group, however large the group is. Okay, so Shechem, the son of Hamor the Chivite, who was the chief of the land, um, saw her. Now, she's Lear Oat. She is to see among the daughters of the land. He sees her. It's the same, it's the same word. Okay, so his seeing is his seeing the same as her seeing. In other words, his seeing leads to uh, the rest of verse two, as I translate it. Uh, he took her, he lay with her, and he humbled her. Okay, or the now that's that's the again the literal translation. The Yitz Chaim says, "Lay with her by force." Okay, so he raped her. Even if um, we just translate it literally, we understand that there is coercion here. 
Um, and so, yes, it is rape. So now, now we can, now we can look at the first two sentences and see what was her looking and what was his looking. And is her looking the same as his looking or do they have to be? Okay, she went out to look among the daughters of the land. He, he looked and saw her, took her, lay with her and humbled her or simply put, he raped her. So what do you think the looking is? And are they the same looking? Because the commentators have something to say about Dina, and I don't want to. I don't want to get to the commentary yet. I just, but it's based on the looking, the Lear Oat in verse one, and the Vayar in verse two, and it's also based on her on the very first word Vatet say. What was the intent? What was her intention, or was there in an intention to her going out? So, what do you think? about these two sentences. Anything about these two sentences strike out to you? Any comment you want to say about it? So think about it as I now. Let, let's, let's look below on uh, in Eitz Chaim. Now, uh, it says uh, above the line, above the line on the left-hand side on 206, went out. Girls of marriageable age normally would not leave a rural encampment to venture alone into an alien city. Now, how do we know? How do we know she's going into a city? She's just going out. We assume she's leaving her tent or the whatever the home looks like, you know, extended tent community, but how do we know she's going to a city? The narrative subtly criticizes Dina's highly unconventional behavior through its use of the Hebrew stem, meaning to go out. Again, is the narrative subtly criticizing Dina? I really don't think so. I just compared this vatetse to the Jake, to the very first word of the portion vayetse. And there, Jacob left home. Now, we know why Jacob is leaving home. He's running away from Esau. But is there a criticism there of Vayetze? It's just what he's doing. So why can't it be the same thing here with Dina? This is just what she's doing. Maybe this just happens to be something um, important happens this time that she goes out. Maybe she frequently went out to see among the daughters of the land. In other words, to hang out with people, with girls her own age. That's what- You know, she had, she had all brothers. She so. had, we think so, but at least, you know, when at uh, the beginning of this portion, we, um, Jacob is kind of arranging all of his children in order as they prepare to meet, um, as they prepare to meet Esau. And he has, just a second. Um, uh, right, so he, um, he uh, and in chapter 33 on page 203, looking up, Jacob saw Esau coming. He divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maids, putting the maids and their children first, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph last. Okay, so we can assume that all the children he has are those that are listed in last week's portion. It's possible he had more, okay? So it's possible he had other daughters. Dina is the one mentioned back in that list only because of what happens here in chapter 34. I'm just suggesting that uh, we, I apply this uh, thinking because of the very beginning of the Torah, when it's Adam and Eve, and it's Cain and Abel. And it's clear in the story, there's got to be other people around, because Cain marries somebody, 
And uh, who's he marrying, right? And that's why you need the Midrash. Well, there were girls born too. Well, that's weird. The Midrash creates it at, at the, or imposes an incestuous relationship among a four Cain, uh, as the story describes in chapter four. So there sh should be other people who were, um, who were around at that time. So it's possible that there are other children here too. Okay. So, so um, Saul, what was your, your point again about Dina being the only daughter? Well, uh, if I remember, Lerot means just to go out and see, yes. you know, she had all these, these brothers around. She wanted to see, I mean, I see my granddaughter, you know, she has three, <laughs> three brothers, uh, brothers. <laughs> and when she, we go to the park, she seeks out other girls. Uh -huh, right, right. It's clearly from the straightforward sense of the, of the verse, that's what it's about. If we if we take the Torah literally and that she only has brothers, then yes, either she's she's uh, she has to be stuck with the older women in the house, right? Her mother, her aunt, and the other maid servants, and possibly the daughters of those maid servants who could be her age. So she could she could be restricted to hang out with them or she could be granted permission to leave and see who else is there. There isn't a sense of schooling happening, right? We don't know from the Torah that kids went to school. There's no, no such thing that we, that we know about. But the commentary already is, is, uh, is, is having us think of some negative ideas that, that, her, that, that her going out the going out itself is negative. That wasn't normal practice. And she has negative, and it's, it's like, um, you know, uh, you think of high school kids and mom and dad, I'm going to the mall, okay? Uh, why are you going to the mall? Do you have money? Um, here, take a few dollars to get, a, to get something to eat or whatever. You're going to the movie. I'm just talking pre-COVID times and what, what kids would be doing. So how much control do we have over our kids when they're going out? Are we driving them when they're going out? Are, are they going out on their own? Are they taking a bus or, are they, or is a friend driving them, right? All of these are decisions we make as parents in terms of how much we can um, allow our grip on them to, to, be, to, uh, to be maintained. And like we can be sure that they're going to be safe. So the idea here about her going out, is she leaving the grip of her parents or is she allowed by her parents to be going out? We don't know. Not sure that you have to read it in a negative way. Okay. And then, um, and then the, the also the, the rest of that commentary on the right column above the line this has been interpreted by some medieval and modern commentators as a reference to some coquettish or promiscuous conduct. We don't know except for because of what happens in verse two. So then verse, then the commentaries, all men, would be suggesting that it's Dina's fault for this happening to her. Had she not left home, had she not had this brazen, immodest attitude about going out, then she wouldn't have put herself in the situation that would have led to uh, being raped by Shechem. Had she just stayed home, she would have been safe. So putting the blame on Dina, as opposed to, as opposed to putting the blame on Shechem. With a little politics here, whatever the name of that guy is in Kenosha, Wisconsin, where the jury's deliberating, right? He went to a protest from another state with a submachine gun on his shoulder. And he's claiming self-defense in killing the people who he thought were uh, threatening him, okay? So what's the idea of going out and what was, what was Dina's idea of going out? 
it's like that Jodie Foster movie that uh, that came out uh, 10, 20 years ago about uh, playing a woman who was raped in a bar and um, just and, and claiming uh, and and uh, and the, the subsequent trial that happens in the movie. And so uh, claiming that, well, she had it coming to her because of how she was dressed and and the flirtatious movements that she was doing. So is that fair? And it's just the nature of our society today that um, uh, just uh, how rape is um, is <clears throat> is take is is dealt with legally in various jurisdiction jurisdictions across the country. It's still, for the most part, <clears throat> um, all of it, all the um, work all the legal work is incumbent upon the woman to prove that it's the guy's fault. And, uh, you know, it's all, it's, it's all about, you know, Harvey Weinstein and then also, what's, what's her name? Giselle Maxwell and the other guy um, who was- Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein, right? And Prince- well, Jewish Andrew. people. And uh, right, no, not uh, not casting aspersions or anything, uh, you know, uh, nothing. I'm just saying that it's out there and that it's all about protecting the man and men are allowed to act like a man, but a woman is still expected in the year 2021 to behave and act a particular way. So you have men commenting on the Torah who are projecting their thought, right? Why is it that a woman in, in Jewish tradition, a woman has to cover her hair and has to cover her arms and legs in public, right? Why is it that a man doesn't have to do that? It's for modesty and you're not allowed to hear the voice of a woman in public either singing. Right? So it's all about male perspective and control over woman in society. And it is in um, the, only in a non-orthodox world that we see um, that um, the, the whole idea of dress and, and egalitarian ideas of gender um, conformity breaking down is only in the non-Orthodox world, right? It's still, especially in the ultra-Orthodox world today, still the case. It's, uh, you know, it's not quite like the um, Muslim women who are completely covered in black from head to toe under a tent-like garment. It's not quite like that in the ultra-Orthodox world, but it's pretty close. It's pretty close. What the woman has to do in public that a man doesn't have to do. Okay. So all of this related because of what happened in verse two, that we apply that to verse one to try to, that the commentaries do, as opposed to just suggesting that it's just innocent Dina going out to hang out with friends and then being attacked by Shechem. Okay, so there are no, um, well, no, that's not true. Nachmanides sees it that way. Nachmanides, so it's unusual for a medieval commentator to suggest that it was Shechem's fault and that it wasn't Dina's fault at all. Okay, so now let's go on with the story. So he rapes her. Now, verse three. Vatidbak nafsho bedina bat Yaakov, vayehav et hana'ara, vayedaber alev hana'ara. So now, his, um, yeah, so the, the English translation here in the Eitz Chaim, I'm going to do this literally. His body was attracted to, so vatid bak. So the modern Hebrew word devek is glue. And scotch tape is niar devek, uh, glue paper. So devek is glue. So lehadbik is to attach uh, with glue or tape, 
uh, something. So it's to cleave to, to attach to. And nefesh in the Torah is definitely body. It is not soul. In modern Hebrew, nefesh is soul and goof is body. In, in biblical Hebrew, nefesh is body. His body cleaved to Dina, the daughter of Jacob. So now you can, uh, not to be too graphic here, but you can imagine teenagers in love. Well, not just teenagers, young love. You kind of are attached at the hip, no matter where you're going and everywhere that you're going, right? Just, just, just remember your first uh, the beginning of your courtship with your spouse. You're always together, uh, constantly hands all over each other. So you can understand the Hebrew meaning that because nefesh is body. So Shechem was attached to Dina and he loved the girl, Vayehav, and he loved Hana'ara, the girl. So I would say young woman, okay? It's unclear age-wise what Na'ara is. Is it preteen? Is it teenager? Answer is yes. But if he rapes her, she's not preteen. So we're understanding this as teenager. But what's the minimum age for a Na'ara? What's a maximum age for Na'ara? Can't tell you, but somehow it's like teenager that like, I would say 14. Okay, if he's raping her, you would imagine that she looks like a woman. So say 13, 14 to like 18, 19, maybe in that age range. Yes, Jan. So earlier in the in the chapter, it says that um, when Jacob and crew are going up to um, meet with Esau, yeah, and um, like they're all getting ready to walk through the water. Yes. And then, um, everybody is walking, but Dina is locked in a chest. The, uh, that's Midrash. That's um, just a second. He, uh, yeah, that's not in the Torah, Jan. Okay, because that's that's in this translation. So I just kind of so it just. Oh, that's uh, you're looking at the art school translation. No, I'm looking at my other translation. Which but, other one? I just Chabad. Just what? Chabad. Chabad. Oh, yeah. Chabad incorporates Midrash into their translation. Because that's just Chabad's, um, that's Chabad's just way to, to, to suggest that how the Midrash understands the Torah is how we're supposed to understand the Torah. So it's misleading. Do they even do anything in italics to show a difference between literal? It's in parentheses. It's parentheses. So the, it's, it's Midrash, Jan. Okay. So I'm just so if there is a midrash that's like that, then that would tell me that she's of age where they were concerned and wanted to keep her pure until her marriage. Okay, no? that's yes, yes, that there is midrash about Dina, but it's so okay. Let me let me uh, let me try to. Uh, focus my thoughts here on how best to answer this question. Where The rabbis were presented just like we're presented with the text of the Torah. But we also have to understand that just as we've gone through the Torah many times in our life, each time that we're reading the Torah, like we're reading chapter 34 right now, we have to keep in mind everything that came before and everything that comes after, okay? So part of reading Torah is understanding the context in which we are reading it, okay? So that, that's point number one. So no matter how we're reading the Torah, if we're reading the Torah like the rabbis in order to derive some kind of lesson from it, 
or we're just reading it just as a straight a, a person a person appreciating literature no matter how you read literature you're going to read it and try to understand why the author chose that particular word or is there a reference here to something that came before or is this foreshadowing something that's coming later okay so that's normal part of reading no matter how we're reading it but the rabbis of the midrash as Chabad incorporates it into its translation, is reading the text in order to teach us re Jewish moral and religious values, okay? So the idea of putting Dina in a chest is related to Isaac and Rebecca having to go down to Gerar in order to get food when there's a famine, and Abraham and Sarah going down to Egypt to uh, get food to escape the famine in the land of Israel, and their concern, Abraham and Isaac's concern, for how their wives are going to be treated. Okay, so there is a sense in the Torah itself about how the women in the story are gonna be treated by non-family members and what potential threat there is to their body, to the women's body, and that, and if the women are going to be taken, then what kind of effect that will have on the men, on Abraham and Isaac, okay? So there is that sense in the Torah from the text itself about a concern about a woman's um, her, the woman's um, sanctity because she's married and that they don't, that the men don't want their, their wives' status permanently negatively affected by someone else. So the thought then is that um, Dina is the only daughter that we know that Jacob, Leah, and Rachel have or their maids or his maid servants too. So they're going to protect, they're going to want to protect Dina as much as the other women have been protected. So yes, there is that element too. And then there's also among the Midrash. So, I, so now, Jan, why don't you read for me what how Chabad translates the, the first verse that we started with today. So unmute yourself and so it says Dina, Leah's yeah. daughter, whom she had born to Yaakov, went out to observe the daughters of the land. Uh, Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the land, saw her. He took her, lay with her, and violated her. All right, so there's no, parent there's no parentheses to these two sentences. That's interesting. No. They don't add any midrash there. Okay. The next sentence has it. Uh -huh, the next sentence has Midrash. The, the, yeah. Oh, so what does it say about verse three? Which so is, the next one, it says his soul cleaved to Dina, yeah. Yaakov's daughter. He loved the girl. He spoke to the girl's heart, parentheses, telling her how much wealth he had more than Yaakov. Uh, yeah. It's just so funny. It's just so funny that, that the Chabad does this. Okay. It's fascinating. I, so it's not wrong. It's just that it 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 just the uh, the buyer of the Chabad Bible needs to be aware that the translation will incorporate midrash into the translation. It's not the it's not straight text that we're reading. Okay, so yes, that's midrash too. What he whispered in her ear, like whispering sweet nothings in in a woman's ear, is that what he thinks is going to get Dina to really love him? I have so much money. I got more money than your father does. I'm going to take good care of you. Is that what a woman wants to hear? It's possible. I don't know. So we think, you know, it's it's the stuff of, of, of movies, right? And TV shows that you think that the more money you have, that you can give more of expensive gifts to the woman, she's going to love you even more. Well, for some women that works, but I'm not sure, I, don't, I know it doesn't work with every woman, but it's interesting that the, the Chabad is 
is is quoting that midrash of what Dina, what um, what Shechem is saying to, um, yeah, how he's speaking to her heart. That's that's the um, so he he loved the girl. That's where we left off with my translation of verse three. And he spoke to the heart of the girl. So what does that mean? He spoke to the heart of the girl, right? So that's why the Midrash is suggesting, well, perhaps that's what she cares about is money. And that's how Shechem spoke to her heart. Um, but speaking to her heart, if, if we already know that he loved her, he's speaking romantically to her. Okay, Gabe. Is it possible that the Torah is speaking of a kind of date rape sort of situation? Oh, well, it's more than that, uh, because um, it's just not it's not just a one time encounter. And then he goes he goes away. Hmm. He wants to stay. He so this is this is this could be date rape, um, but it's he wants to marry her. OK, he wants to stay with her. He falls in love with her. Whereas date rape, date rape, you know, whatever, putting, putting a drug in a, in a woman's drink is for the purpose of having your way, having one's way with the woman. And then she'll forget, she won't remember anything that happened and he'll never see her again and she'll never see him again. So well, it doesn't need to be that extreme. It could just be a uh, lack of consent among two people who are that could be. Dating. That could be. Yeah, but uh, right, uh, um, right. So that's that's what it was here because it's clear from the Hebrew in verse two. He took her. There's nothing about them doing anything together, and he laid with her. It's not like it would have if it was two of them together. He could have said, he cook, he took her. That's how it should have been read if it was consensual. Hmm. They the two of them lay together. That's how the Vaishkavushnehem Yachtav together, or it could just be Vaishkavushnehem. But because Vaishkav Ota, it's clear he lay with her or um just he lay not on her but he 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 the the vayishkav um is um you know in the vahafta paragraph of the shema we recite these words bishoch becha uvekumecha when you lie down and when you rise up okay that's the same word it's the same root here Okay, so it's the it's the verb for, but here it's not it's not it's not sleeping, it is um, it is the uh, sexual act, and he's doing it to her, ota. It that's that's the force of the Hebrew, that he's doing it to her. Vayeaneha. So in case we don't understand that it's not consensual, it's that last word there. He debased her he humiliated her or as our english translation has he lay with her by force okay so that's um it could be understood not as the root aleph nun um yud for poor but uh aleph nun hey for um uh torture or force okay but then after the fact, somehow he falls in love with her. Now, not, not usually rapists, I, I don't know. I, I don't know the mindset of a rapist, uh, whether it's someone who has a, a, a mental health illness for, forcing him to rape or whatever else is going on with that person. Does, the, does a rapist love in a normal kind of way, the victim. Uh, I I don't know. I don't know if there's a normal kind of love here. But from the as the story continues, he 
he acts as if he has fallen in love with her and wants to marry her. I mean, from the from the Jacob and Rachel story, he Jacob fell in love with Rachel. And in the Isaac and Rebecca story, Isaac took Rebecca into his mother's tent and he was con- comforted and he loved her. Okay, so it's it's not unusual already for the Torah to use the term love in uh, describing the relationship between a man and a woman. Okay, so if it's that, but that the love that we know of is Jacob and Rachel and Isaac and Rebecca. So and that's the love. That's the same word used here. So from context, that's what we're led to believe that it's that it's that love. Uh, Rita, do you have a question? No. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah, so, I do. So. Okay. I hope this isn't off the topic, but the way I understood it in those days, you know, from reading yeah. Torah, is that when a man and a woman um, had intercourse, that she was his wife. So what is the concept of if a, wo- if a woman is raped, is she the wife? Do they have to go to a din? How does that work? Yeah, so um, later in the Torah, these are good questions. Later in the Torah, uh, it's, um, yeah, so um, rape is described in the Torah. And in fact, it's, it's uh, the Torah class on Fridays. We're up to, we just finished this section uh, in the portion Kitetse, which describes uh, rape happening and what, what kind of punishment um, would be there for the rapist. And the rapist is supposed to marry the, the woman. Uh, just one second, I'm just pulling it off my shelf. Let me uh, just uh, get back to that section. Um, uh, just one second. Uh, okay. Um, no, it's um, just once. No, I'm sorry, I, I can't find it right away. Um, yeah, so the, some of the laws of, of rape it force the man to marry the woman um, and that, um, you know, it, it's it, it, no rights at all for the woman to understand that this man was forced upon her and that she has to live with him for the rest of her life. Um, it's just a, a terrible attitude from the Torah itself. It's in rabbinic literature that women are given a little bit more say, and that the rapist, like the woman doesn't have to marry the rapist. Um, uh, but the, the, there was a concern, uh, what about the child born of that, um, of that encounter, um, of, about that uh, child born of that violation? Um, if, um, uh, you know, so there, there, there are um, complicating factors uh, that the rabbis try to address in their uh, derivation of Jewish law from what the Torah describes. So uh, women have no rights at all in the Torah. Women are there to be taken by men, and they are cared for either by their father or their uh, husband, or by their, if she's a widow, or by her children. Um, So she, the woman is always cared for by somebody else. A woman is not uh, capable in the Torah or in the Bible of taking care of themselves. Um, And it's um, uh, the, the, the plight of the widow is one that the, the Torah teaches that we should be, um, um, compassionate towards, 
but the the rape victim there's there's just this underlying tone in the Torah and among the rabbis that perhaps there's a sense of the woman being at fault. There there are when rape is described later in sections of law in the Torah, there's whether the rape happened in the city or out in the field. And that is interpreted by the rabbis to mean whether anyone heard her scream. So there's that, the Torah doesn't describe the woman screaming, right? Dina is not screaming here. Dina is not doing anything except being ravished, okay? Uh, she's being spoken to, she's being loved, she's being raped, but she's not doing anything except she went out. That's the only thing she did. So um, for, the, for the rabbis, the idea of whether one is raped in the city or in the field, the rabbis add whether the woman screamed or not. And so you, and the rabbis assume that the woman screamed and that uh, therefore there's a responsibility of other people hearing the scream to come to her defense. So all of that is added from what's not in the Torah. In the, in the description of laws about rape. So it's, it's complicated and it's troubling. Uh, so as time is, is running away from us, I wanna look below the line on 206 and see how our so-called modern commentary, um, what it has to say about this. Incidents like the rape of Dina were probably not uncommon Yet Jacob's family seems unprepared for such an event and does not know how to react. Dina, an only, an only daughter raised in a family of men, was seeking the company of other young women. Although some commentators blame her for leaving the security of her home to consort with strangers, the modern reader will likely reject this effort to blame the victim and minimize the responsibility of the assailant. Characteristically, the narrative describes the actions of men, but never tells us what Dina thought, nor how she felt about what happened. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it, we're left to modern commentaries, so modern midrash, to kind of understand what, uh, what, what happened here. And, um, we also don't know what happens to Dina after the story is over. So we never see her again. So what, what's interesting is that with Midrash, the um, Dina uh, ends up in Egypt and uh, the daughter that is born of this encounter, that's in Midrash, that there's a daughter born of this, uh, becomes, I think she becomes the wife of Joseph that is given by Pharaoh to Joseph. Osnat Paneach is the Egyptian name of the woman who is given to wife by Pharaoh to Joseph. And Ephraim and Menashe are born of that relationship. And that Osnat Paneach is the daughter born here. So that, uh, yeah, it, read, if you haven't, Anita Diamond's novel, The Red Tent, and uh, that uh, story is incorporated, that midrash is incorporated into her novel uh, towards the end of the novel, okay? So uh, with that, it's 10 to 12. Um, um, let's, uh, let's stop here for today. Any other thoughts or comments about this? Gabe. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you said Anita Diamond, not Anita Bryant, right? Anita Diamond, D-I-A-M okay. as in Mary, A-N-T. Okay. Anita Diamond. She also wrote, um, a book called the New Jewish Wedding Book, which is, uh, like the basic book for, um, couples to read to plan for their weddings. But she wrote this novel, uh, The Red Tent, which is uh, really good. Okay.
So folks, with that, uh, just challenging section about Dina and how we can understand it today. Um, have a good day, everybody, and um, see you all next Wednesday. Thank you.